This is Ag Matters PM from the Iowa Agribusiness Radio Network, brought to you by the Iowa Soybean Association. Your daily recap of the information that affects Iowa's farmers, producers, and consumers, right here in the heart of the heartland. With reports from our award-winning broadcast team of Dustin Hoffman, Riley Smith, and Mark Magnuson. Now, from the IARN studios in Des Moines, here's Mark Magnuson. Hello and welcome into Ag Matters PM from the Iowa Agribusiness Radio Network. I'm Mark Magnuson. Today is Thursday, June 27th, 2024, and we're so glad you can join us for today's show. In today's episode, I will bring you the latest Iowa Ag News headlines, and then I will be joined by Seth Mitchell. He is the manager of state pork industry relations for the National Pork Producers Council. And today, Seth is going to tell us about the Young Pork Advocates Issues Meet that took place at this year's World Pork Expo. It's time now for our Closing Market Summary. It's time now for the Ag Matters PM Closing Market Summary, your source for market analysis and settlement prices from the day's trade in Chicago, courtesy of the folks at agmarket.net. At the end of another trading day, we are joined by Kenan Layden of agmarket.net for our Closing Market Discussion. Ken, and getting ready for a lot of information that we're going to receive in the way of reports tomorrow. What did we see take place in the grains today? Grains today continue to pattern in corn and soybeans. They continue to sell off here before the quarterly stocks report and that uh, acreage number that comes out tomorrow. And then wheat today finally found some footing and found some support here and was the big mover on the day. And as we get ready for those reports tomorrow, we always hear, you know, quite a bit of complaining about the USDA seemingly taking a lot of time to make those adjustments and changes. But when it comes to tomorrow's report, is that necessarily not the worst case scenario because we just have so many unanswered questions right now? Yeah, so th- th- there's a lot of, you know, grumblings about USA to USDA reports and the market reacts to them. They're hard to handicap, especially this June report. And that's why you see, you know, such big moves historically on this report. And, you know, um, we'll see what happens with it tomorrow. It's hard to handicap. You know, the the trade guesses are fairly in line with um, what came out in March, maybe added a few acres here or there. But we'll see what the USDA gives us. And with the quarterly grain stocks tomorrow, We will, of course, learn quite a bit from uh, both reports, but in the quarterly grain stocks, it does seem like we have kind of circled the corn and finding out that corn number that we have on hand going to be pretty important tomorrow. Yeah, so, you know, that corn supply, that two point, that two billion bushel carryouts kind of been the gorilla in the room that there's just a lot of domestic supply, which is pressuring those corn prices. And if acres decrease or they find out that stocks are down, you know, that is something that could, you know, lend some support here where corn has been pretty beat up for a long time. And when we saw today with the corn and soybeans, you can kind of see that position squaring, getting ready for tomorrow and maybe just kind of staying to the sidelines a little bit. But we did see the movement to the upside for wheat. Do we have any indications on what's driving that movement? Yeah, so uh, maybe two big factors today that uh, helped that wheat market. Stats Canada released their equivalent of the USDA reports coming out tomorrow, and the wheat number was friendly. Um, It was a little lower than analysts' guesses, but it was pretty in line with them, so they didn't add a lot of wheat acres materially. So that was one thing. And then export numbers that came in today were friendly, too. On the other side of the ag marketplace today, what happened in the protein sector? Yeah, pretty uh, pretty red day in that protein sector um, today with ca- cattle started out lo- looking strong after a strong day yesterday, but they weren't able to hold it. So um, pattern kind of been a very up and down pattern. If you if you look at those cattle charts with, um, you know, they're, they come up and make highs but a little slightly lower than the day before and or the cycle before and just can't hold it or push through some of that resistance. Cash has been strong. I probably sound like a broken record on that, but that cash market seems to really be supporting that. Um, hogs, you know, they had that reversal yesterday on the technical indicators, traded lower, 
closed higher than the previous day and then they just can't hold that there's, there's that's the second time that's occurred so kind of a worrying thing for hogs but we'll see if they can keep some footing here on this reversal Kenan Layden of agmarket.net our guest here at midday Kenan what's the best way for our viewers to get in touch for more marketing information yeah check us out on the web at eggmarket.net. Um, if you guys want to do that, there's some good information uh, our sister company JSA has and that we put out on the quarterly stocks. If you want to check it out before tomorrow. Ken, and thanks so much for the time here today and best of luck tomorrow. I know it's going to be a busy day. Yeah, thank you. Thank you to Ken and Layden of agmarket.net for our market summary. Let's turn now to the closing numbers, which can be found under the markets tab of our website at iowaagnet.com. July corn closed down six and a quarter at 413 and three quarters. July soybeans down 10 and a half at 1152 and a quarter. July soybean meal up a quarter of a cent at 361.10. July soybean oil up four cents at 43.49. Chicago wheat up 18 and a half at 559 and three quarters. Minneapolis wheat up 14 and three quarters at 610 and three quarters. Kansas City hard red wheat up 12 even at 592 even. July oats up nine and a half at 304 even. On the Merck, August live cattle down 30 cents at 186.45. August feeder cattle down $1.12 at 260.65. July lean hogs down 45 cents at 89.45. July pork cutout down 210 at 99.37. Class 3 milk up 5 cents at 19.57. That does it for our ag market coverage for today. It is time now to hear from our sponsor, the Iowa Soybean Association and the Soybean Checkoff. And up next, it is the latest Iowa Ag News headlines. Iowa Soybean Association is driven to deliver for Iowa's 40,000 soybean farmers. We're proud to provide objective agronomic research, a helping hand with soil and water stewardship, and timely industry news powered by the Soybean Checkoff. Learn more at IASoybeans.com. It is time now for the latest Iowa Ag News headlines. The Iowa Utilities Board granted approval for a proposed carbon pipeline project to begin in the state of Iowa. That clears the way for Summit Carbon to build the segment of the pipeline that covers 688 miles in 29 Iowa counties. The board hasn't yet granted a permit that would allow construction to begin. However, Summit can now use eminent domain to acquire the land that they need to complete the project. The board issued a final 507-page decision and order. Quote, after weighing a number of factors for and against Summit's petition, the board found that the service provided by Summit Carbon will promote the public convenience and necessity. End quote. The board wrote that in the decision. Summit will be required to submit numerous revised exhibits before the board issues a permit and before construction begins. The momentum will continue when we file our South Dakota permit application in early July, says Summit CEO Lee Blank. Flooding in several northern states is a reminder that weather events impact crop growth and the ability to transport that crop. Mike Steenhook, the executive director of the Soy Transportation Coalition, says the closure of roads and bridges will result in farmers and elevators having to incur expensive detours to access delivery locations. Quote, one of the biggest examples of the impact of flooding on rail infrastructure is the destruction of the BNSF railway bridge across the Big Sioux River near Sioux City. Steenhook says that this will require considerable time to replace. Considerable soybeans and grain continue to move at this time of year. The flooding is occurring in regions with a number of soybean processing facilities, which operate year round. The damage will clearly impact those facilities. Even if a farmer isn't directly impacted by the damaged infrastructure, it will cost more to ship commodities to operating sections of the transportation network. And also in today's show, I am joined by Seth Mitchell, the manager of State Pork Industry Relations for the National Pork Producers Council. Today, we're going to learn about the Young Pork Advocates Issues Meet, which took place at this year's World Pork Expo. Mark Magnuson for the Iowa Agribusiness Radio Network, and I'm here with Seth Mitchell at World Pork Expo. And Seth, what is your job role within the NPPC? Yeah, so with NPPC, I'm the manager of State Pork Industry Relations. A little bit of a unique role. I'm actually part of a, a multi-experiential immersion program in which I've spent eight months with the Pork Checkoff, eight months with the National Pork Producers Council, and I am currently spending eight months down in Raleigh, North Carolina with the North Carolina Pork Council. North Carolina, a pork state, but it's not quite Iowa, Seth. It's, no, it's you know, it's up there, but not quite <laughs> Iowa. And here today you have some students with you that are in college and they're working through a program. What are they working on? Yeah, so really 
glad to have a group of very bright young people from across the country here in Des Moines, Iowa this week to participate in a new event called the Young Pork Advocates Issues Meet. Uh, through this event, our participants are able to discuss a prompted industry issue uh, that we provide them. Uh, they engage in preparatory research, collaborative discussion, ultimately forming some creative solutions to those issues um, that they can translate into mock motions and uh, learn more about the NPPC grassroots policy development process. And Seth, we've had a chance to speak with some of these students here today at World Pork Expo, and I would imagine if they're in the program, they're going to be this way, but it really seems like some self-starters that really are, you kind of just have to direct them and they're gonna take, take off and run with it. That's right, and those are the kind of people we wanna recruit into this program, you know, those people who are positioning themselves to be the future leaders within the pork industry. And what's kind of been the messaging for them of what they need to be getting across to people to that future group of pork producers and people that are involved in the pork industry because as we know, American agriculture aging rapidly, and we know that the American farmer continues to be up there in age a little bit, and we need to get more younger people involved in agriculture. So what's that been like, that drive to get them to be that next wave? Well, yes, I mean, as you allude to, fewer and fewer people are actually growing up on the farm. And as issues in the pork industry continue to mount, we're going to need that next generation of young people to step up and get involved in the process. And so this is just one way that we can reach out to those people, um, get them boots on the ground here at the World Pork Expo. Of course, we love having them involved with this contest, but just the opportunity to walk around to the different vendors and exhibitors here at the expo, um, learn about different different technologies and issues within the industry and uh, hopefully um, be an advocate for the pork industry and someone that NPPC can call on when we have future opportunities uh, geared towards that age group. So what do you feel about the students that you've worked with? Are they going to be ready to hit the ground running as soon as they're done with school and get involved in the agriculture industry? Yeah, I've been able to have some conversations with these people. Um, again, very sharp, very bright, outgoing individuals. And uh, I think you know the future is, is anything that they want it to be at this point. Seth, is there anything else you'd like to let our audience here in Iowa, our viewers, listeners, know about when it comes to what you're working on with MPPC? Yeah, well, I'd be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to our inaugural sponsors for this event, uh, Novus and Nutribus. Blend. Uh, they've been instrumental in uh, kind of challenging us to get more young people involved with World Pork Expo and the conception of this idea. Um, their support has been greatly appreciated and uh, we look forward to continuing this event uh, well into the future. He is Seth Mitchell with the National Pork Producers Council. Seth, thanks so much for taking the time to join us and have a great rest of the expo. Yeah, thank you. Thank you to Seth Mitchell with the NPPC for joining today's show. And that brings us to the end of today's episode. You can find all of our content on our website at iowaagnet.com. You can also follow us on Facebook, X, LinkedIn, and TikTok. And you can find our video content and previous episodes of AMPM on our YouTube channel. Don't forget as well our free morning, midday, and closing market podcast, which are found on Apple, Amazon, Google, Spotify, and Podbean. From the Iowa Agribusiness Radio Network Studios in Des Moines, I'm Mark Magnuson. On behalf of Riley Smith, Dustin Huffman, Quentin Slater, and Andy Peterson, we thank you for watching. This has been Ag Matters PM.